Good to see you all, and uh, I see that we are a typical auditorium class spread to the four corners. I do hope that you will speak up when you wish to uh, comment in class, but I will encourage you to speak as if you're on the back row and somebody's hiding in the baptistry that you got to talk to, to try to speak up. And if I can't hear you, I'll do like this. And to be frank with you, I might not hear you well. We used to, when I was young, we'd go up to Missouri and we'd be there in the living room and Tisha's dad controlled the remote. I mean, it didn't get six inches from his fingers. And I'd be sitting there and I'd think, why is TV so loud? And sometimes I'd almost think, I can't stay in here, it's so loud. Well, now fast forward, we've been married 43 years, and somebody comes to my house and the TV's on, and they might say, why is TV so loud? Because it seems like our hearing can diminish a little bit as age creeps up on us. We're continuing in the book of Mark, uh, where Brandon left off in Mark chapter 2. And as I mentioned last week, I very much enjoy studying and teaching from Mark, but I would say this, the Gospels generally. Um, of course, with Mark, you've got the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are times when what you're studying in Mark, you're going to find it in another gospel, or as in the case of today, you're going to find it in all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And of course, then John, well, John's just kind of different, and most of what John has is not in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Of course, there are a few things that you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I would say this, anytime you're studying it's best to go back and, and see what's said in each account when it's there because sometimes you'll pick up on a detail that the specific gospel you're studying doesn't have. Um, you know, we say rich young ruler. You don't get rich young ruler out of one, not even two gospel accounts. It's when you read all three that you get the rich, the young, the ruler. But we say you're a rich young ruler generally. And today, it's kind of uh, similar. There's a little bit of detail elsewhere, not an extreme, but just a little bit. And if we can, we'll be looking at verses 18 through the end of the chapter. Um, I, I think in terms of, of studying uh, a third to half a chapter each week, Maybe not push it to do a whole chapter, but try to do more than just a single paragraph. Sometimes some paragraphs warrant more discussion and consideration. We are today at chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And I've got the heading above it, a question about fasting. Let's uh, begin with prayer and then we'll get into more. Our Father in heaven, as we come together in this class, we pray that ultimately our desire is to glorify you, to serve you, 
and then to learn more about you and your word. And we pray that our intention would be to live in a way to please you with what we learn from your word. We pray that we would be determined to see just what it says, what it teaches, and apply it. We're thankful that you've given it to us, preserved it for us, and made it so readily available to us in this age. And Father, we ask you to bless us as we study as a class. We ask you to bless us as a congregation. We ask you to bless us as we next hour enter into worship. Father, we continue to pray for our friends in the church in Ukraine, that they would be safe and that this war would end soon, that what has started in Israel would end soon, and that these so many nations around the world that are manning their arsenals, that they could kind of take a step back and say, we want peace with the world. Father, we are thankful for your mercy, your grace, your love. We continue to pray for those among us who are sick. And we know Carrie's had a difficult time with her treatment, that Becky's had a very difficult time overcoming her sickness. We have many others that deal chronically with difficulties and trouble. We pray that all be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mark chapter 2. We're going to read the entirety of chapter 2 through 18 through 22. This is the entirety of it, and then we'll go back and begin to look at it. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. That's the entirety of this section. And, and some of it is kind of straightforward, very easy. And then towards the end, there's, I don't think it's as easy. And with what some have said about it, frankly, I disagree. And we'll get to that when we get to that point. To begin with, it says, now John's disciples and the Pharisees. In Luke chapter 5, verse 33, it says they, and when you go back to see the antecedent of they, you'd find the Pharisees and their scribes. And in a very specific way, the scribes, you know, I want to say just hearing the word scribe, copier of the law, but it had more to do than just someone who might copy the law. He was almost an expert in the law, a student of the law. Now, as to a scribe, Oftentimes, they were Pharisees. Pharisees and Sadducees, well, that was various sects of the Jews along with the Essenes and the Zealots, etc. Uh, to say a scribe is not to say Sadducee or Pharisee, though most of the scribes would have been Pharisees. But here we have, in a very specific way, um, John's disciples and the Pharisees. Matthew 9, 14 says disciples of John. Now we're going to more and more as we get into the life and the ministry of Jesus see the opposition that comes his way. At this point, it's only just really getting started. Um, there had been a little bit of opposition or questioning when he healed the paralytic. And then of course, with regards to verses 13 through 17, him eating with the sinners, some criticism about that. But the opposition and criticism is really just 
getting started. And of course, when we say, where did it come from mostly? Well, really, mostly the Pharisees. Sometimes you read the lawyers or scribes, and of course, sometimes Sadducees as well. And sometimes, of course, leaders of the Jews, which quite often that might have been more so Sadducees than Pharisees. But here, disciples of John and the Pharisees, it's almost like, well, this seems odd that we're talking about the disciples of John and the Pharisees joining up. It's like, what do they have in common? But they were both concerned about this, that their disciples, the people who were of John's disciples, and then the Pharisees themselves, they were fasting. And they were noticing, hey, we're fasting. Jesus' disciples are not fasting. And so what gives? Now, if you were to go back and say... um, history of fasting with regards to the day of atonement that was a mandated fast day that was basically the only mandated fast day you find that in a couple of places Leviticus 16 29 to 31 would be one of those places now an interesting thing is it says afflict yourselves it doesn't say fast But everybody, you might say universally, and I would say the Jews from that time forward understood this is talking about fasting. Afflict yourselves is the words that we have in the text. Now I would suggest to you this, that Jesus, as he fulfilled the law, as he kept God's law perfectly, I'd suggest that Jesus, yes, he did fast on the Day of Atonement, because that was mandated within the law. Beyond that, the many, many, many fastings of the Jews, it was not mandated. It was something that they came to do. And by tradition, it came to be almost bound upon, let me say this, the pious, the good, the want to be good, or the want to look like I'm good anyway. Jew. Do you remember the prayers of that Pharisee and the sinner? And how the Pharisee, I'm glad I'm not lying. And, and then he starts enumerating what he does. He says, I fast twice in the week. That would be a a good example of God, look at me, I'm pious, I fast, and by the way, if somebody else doesn't, he's not as good, and he's not as pious. Now, when you get to the Old Testament and read about fasting, you're going to read a number of occasions concerning fasting. For instance, Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, 7. Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20, verse 34. Ahab, remember Ahab? 1 Kings 21, 4. David, 2 Samuel 3, 35. And if you were to go back in each of those instances and say, okay, why were they fasting? Was it uniquely, I want to show God I'm good? No. In fact, in those instances, it had to do with a circumstance that had gripped them, leading them to do without eating. For instance, Hannah has no children, particularly distraught praying, and she had fasted. Jonathan, Jonathan and David, like that, you know, good friends. His daddy Saul, you know, he'd gotten worse and worse and worse about his jealousy towards David, and finally got to the point, Jonathan, 
You can't have anything more to do with him, in essence. He was disturbed. He fasted. Ahab, remember what caused him to fast? I can't get that vineyard Naboth has. And he was pouting. And along with that fasting, okay, in that instance, there's nothing noble about that. David? David had a baby that was born, you remember? Bathsheba's first child, sick, eventually died. And during that period, he fasted, he prayed. I think that you can relate to this because I just have an idea that there have been some occasions in life that so gripped you and grabbed you, you completely lost your appetite for food. As far as your desire for food, you looked at it, it looked to you like something like straw, hay, stubble, and you didn't want it. And if you ate a bite, you were full and almost sick to your stomach. Emotions can do that. And I think that's what we find described here in those few instances. Now, let me just tell you, sometimes people get sick and they don't want food and they need to eat. My dad, in his last years, he didn't have much of an appetite. He did kind of for breakfast still, but the rest of the day, no. But he said this, he says, I don't eat because I want to eat. I eat because I know I'm supposed to eat. Well, when you get sick and don't want food, you remember that saying, and you eat, and you get better. Now, there's some other times that we find fasting in the Old Testament. In fact, several times that are directly attached to mourning. And in, those, in some of those cases, it was very much mourning can't eat. Some of it was mourning and the appropriate thing kind of like is not to eat, almost as if to show my... Uh, my honor for this one that's deceased. And you find that on several occasions in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you're going to find that there's times that fasting took place when there was a need for it. And just due to time, we're not going to go and just look up all these and read them, but Acts 13, 2, Acts 14, 23... 2 Corinthians 6, 5, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. 27. Fasting, yes, it was within and a part of Christians and the New Testament church. But there was no command about it in a sense of, on this day, you fast. But it was just recognized that there are times in life that so grip us. There can be maybe occasions that are so important the food doesn't matter, or you don't want the food. Or maybe a little bit you give yourself over to not eating and spending it that time in prayer. But no, there was not a certain, here you've got this going on, you fast. There was not a, it's this day of the month now, you fast. So here we got Jesus. His disciples are not fasting. The disciples of the Pharisees, of John, they are fasting. Again, we're not talking about the mandated fast, Day of Atonement. The only assumption we could have is that, yes, Jesus would have fasted because he kept the law on that day. But beyond that, the fastings were voluntary. They were 
and maybe should have been more individual, but doing them and when you do them had so worked in the fiber of their religion, it's like they had made it a law. But it wasn't a law. It was their tradition. And a little bit of it even was, look at me, I'm fasting, I'm good. Now, we're fasting? Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? Well, before we even get into his response, we need to understand their fasting was not mandated by the law, wasn't commanded. It had become a traditional thing. Well, then we find Jesus answering this question. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, can the wedding guest fast when the bridegroom is with them, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Actually, we have three illustrations that answer the question, why don't your disciples fast. The first one, first answer, the wedding, the bridegroom, he's there. Let me ask you this. Weddings, and you got the bride and the bridegroom and the guest. Is it a joyous occasion? <laughs> I got a should be right here. And, uh, yeah, I don't think they all have been, maybe, um, but should be, and most of the time, they are. And, and I just say this, if somebody chooses to just say I do with no guest, that's their choice, their business. I hope even that occasion is one of joy. Or it may be that I've seen the time that the wedding party had over 30 people in it. So many attendants and then the bridegroom preacher and then some children as well, ring bear and flower girl. And, and, it, and it took, one time I did a wedding and the, de the father of the bride, he says, now you make it short. It took 20 minutes to get all those people inside that were going to stand in front of you. Couldn't make that short. No matter what I did, it couldn't be short. Joyous occasion? Yes. Smiles? Yes. Joy? Yes. Don't you think here that Jesus is hinting at himself being the bridegroom? He's with them now. It should be a time of joy. By the way, remember the fasting? A lot of the occasions and the examples of fasting were not times of joy. They were times that were so difficult that it's as if a hand had reached out and was squeezing the heart of man. And he was distraught. He was disturbed. He was sad. Maybe he was mourning. And he was fasting. That's not this occasion. Jesus is there. Now I know we are at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And I know as it were, they are learning who Jesus is. But do you remember how it got introduced? Here's John and his disciples. Here Jesus comes on the scene. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and even now, early in the ministry, you know, right here in chapter 1 and chapter 2, you're finding miracle after miracle after miracle along with Jesus' teaching. 
to see this, to hear this, to know this. It's a time of rejoicing. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. He's here. There was there going to be a time when the bridegroom would be taken away from them. You just go back and you read like John 13 through about 16 and John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. See, Jesus is on the cusp of his betrayal, trials, crucifixion, and death. And they're, they're kind of finally understanding this to some degree. Let not your heart be troubled. Then when you read about the betrayal and the arrest, Peter stands up and you know what he does? He chops off the ear of Malchus, but ultimately the disciples flee. And then Jesus dies, is resurrected, but yet they're kind of like a, I almost would describe the disciples at that point of Jesus' betrayal, arrest, trials, crucifixion, like fish out of water. We knew who we were, we knew who our Lord was, and now what? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in that day. So he's describing, I think his disciples, the bridegroom's here. It's a time of joy. It's a time where you, if, if anything, you're celebrating not being in mourning in sadness, troubled, distraught, which is likely to bring on the fasting. I think that's kind of the explanation of that first part. But now these second two things that are said, then I'm amazed at kind of how when I read what people say about this, they kind of shift gears and go down a road that is not in this context. Remember, keep it in mind, what's going on here is disciples of John and the Pharisees are asking Jesus, why do our disciples fast and yours don't? That's what Jesus is answering. And the first part that begins to answer this is, well, the bridegroom's here. Time of joy rejoicing. There's going to be a time when he's not. They'll fast then. That's a time of trouble. That's a time of mourning. Then the next thing he says, though, look at verse 21. No man sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old and a worse tear is made. Now, you know, what he's describing here, I'm not sure young folks today really can understand and even appreciate this. Um, in fact, I'm on the young side of it, kind of. Uh, speaking of sewing a patch on clothing, and then is it shrunk or unshrunk? What's the word? Here's the, here's the fancy word. What's sanforized mean? Pre-shrunk. It's the fancy way of saying pre-shrunk. Why do our clothes not shrink today? Well, mine have, at least in around the waist. But no, seriously, why do our clothes, it's not as much of an issue. I got a private fabric pre-shrunk. What else? Somebody, I heard somebody say something. 
synthetic fibers. Does polyester even shrink, you know, rayon and yada, yada, yada. In fact, what about cotton? What about wool? And which would have been more the, certainly, the fabrics of old compared to the last, what, 75 years. Now, I had some cotton kind of shorts I wear around the house, and they're, I don't know how much more I got, how much long, how much more life I got in them. If I go to the store and I was looking, these things are cotton. I couldn't find any cotton shorts. I'm not joking. Couldn't find any. I went to about three stores and I looked, looked the fabric. So we moved to a day to where um, the fabrics themselves are synthetic, so the shrunk, not shrink, is not as much of a, of a deal. But he is, it was the case that if you had an old piece of, say, you had some old jeans, they'd been washed, they'd been washed, they'd been washed, they've already shrunk up all they're going to shrink. You get a tear in them. And then it was saying, then you put a piece of, you, you, you you patch it with unshrunk cloth, well, that unshrunk cloth is going to shrink. But the other around it is not going to shrink. It's done shrunk. Is that right? Done shrunk. Um, and so it's going to ultimately tear. It's going to be worse than it was before. That's, that's what he's saying. See, then we have to say, well, what does he mean by this? And then the next illustration, verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And I hear again, he's talking about something none of you have done or probably seen. We don't, and you know what? I'm glad we're not having to take animal skins to use for bottles. Okay, I'm just glad of that. I'm glad we kind of moved beyond it. But here they take... Um, Take some grape juice, the wine, and they put it in this skin. The skin is the bottle. We see over time that grape juice may ferment a bit and give off some gases, causing it to expand. And his point is if it's kind of a new wine skin, then it's still got that elastic nature and it can expand with it. But on the other hand, you take that new wine, that fresh grapes, and you put it in that old wine skin that's already stretched out, and you fill it up, and then with a little bit of maybe fermentation and the gases that kind of spew off, it, it can't stretch, so it burst. And you've lost your wine skin and you lost all your wine, your grape juice, in your little bottle. Years ago, I heard about this boy at Fried Hardeman, and it, I think it had been a little before my time, but he was from North Mississippi, and they had muscadines there. Y'all know what muscadines are. And they would take the muscadines, and they'd put them in a big jar and kind of mush on them, kind of turn them a little juicy, put a little sugar in there and kind of let them a day or two uh, and then they would drink that. And so they basically had uh, sweet muscadine juice. Now he just loved it. And he, they called it muscadine wine. But at that juncture, no, it was just muscadine juice, sweet. But his roommates had never had any, so he thought, I'm going to bring some back, fix some up, put it in his jar. And he put it up in the top of his closet and forgot about it. A couple months, three months later, oh, he unscrews it. Guess what happens? Because of all those gases in it. It was contained in that jar. The jar didn't burst. The wine skins, old wine skins, they would have burst. Now, when I think about muscadines, I really do think about my uncle, though. He, uh, he was dating this lady, and he made a muscadine cobbler. 
And she remarked, she was very proper, and she remarked, well, how did you get the seeds out of them? He says, I just put the muscadine in my mouth, and I kind of bite on it and squirt them out. And she didn't quite know what to say to that. And then she says, well, they're, they're really tender. How did you get them so tender? He says, I just chew on them a while. Um, I don't know that that's how he did it, but apparently he made a good muscadine cobbler out of those holes. So then what is he saying here then about this untrunk fabric and what is he saying about the old and new wineskins? Now, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. In the church and out of the church, I've heard and I've read time and time again um, something like this. Now, this is from Burton Kaufman. Burton Kaufman was one of the most prolific writers in the Churches of Christ, writing a volume on every Bible book from Genesis to Revelation. You can get them free on eSword, and I would encourage you to do it. And it's worth reading after Kaufman. But here's what he said. The force of this humble metaphor, and he's talking here about the unshrunk cloth, and then, of course, the wineskins. He says, if a piece of new unshrunk cloth is used to mend a hole in an old garment, then just as soon as the garment is washed, the new material will shrink, thus tearing out an even larger hole in the garment. The application of this means that, here's his explanation, the application of this means that Christ did not come to patch up Judaism with the new teachings of Christianity. His holy religion was not designed to mend old, religious, old religions, but was a glorious new thing bearing the same relationship to Judaism that a building has to scaffolding that precedes it. It seems preferable to make the forms, ceremonies, and ordinances of Judaism to be the old wineskins, and Jesus' new teachings could not be subordinated to and synchronized with such things as Jewish feast. Well, like I said, in the church, out of the church, I've read so many times where people were saying, oh, this is, you can't patch that old Old Testament with, with the new Jesus' teachings. It's, it's brand new. And then I go back and I read, where in here am I finding anything about Old Testament, New Testament, Judaism, Christianity, Mosaic dispensation, Christian dispensation? They ask a question about why are your disciples not fasting? I personally think that every one of these illustrations is just similar in nature, heaped upon to say, here's why my disciples are not fasting. And as I was studying for this, I thought, okay, does anybody, I don't go down that road about Jesus patching up the Old Testament and the New Testament. Does he do that? No, he doesn't. He's not patching up the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's not patching up Judaism with Christianity. He's not patching up the Mosaic dispensation with the Christian dispensation. He's not doing that. But is that what this is teaching? I don't think so. I don't see anything in the context to demand such or even hint of it. And then I read this from McGarvey. McGarvey's commentary on Matthew Mark is very, very, very good. I don't even know if it's available today. Though, Matthew, though the fourfold gospel by McGarvey is available on eSword and various other uh, internet sources for free. But here's what McGarvey said. He said, the argument drawn from these two examples is not, as some have supposed, that it would be absurd to patch the old Jewish garment with the unfulled, that's the unshrunk, cloth of the gospel. Or to put the new wine of the gospel into the old issue was not concerning the proper relation of the gospel dispensation to the Jewish law. In other words, he's saying it's not what all these other folks have said. He says, but it is one concerning the propriety of fasting on a certain occasion. He's getting back to the context, the question that was asked. Moreover, in Luke's report of this answer we find the additional argument no man having drunk old wine straightway desireth new for he says the old is better 
Luke 5, 39. To carry out the interpretation just named would make Jesus here argue that the old dispensation was better than the new. But the argument is the same as in the first example. That was the bridegroom and you're not fasting then because he's here. It shows that it would have been absurdly inappropriate to the occasion for the disciples to fast as much to mourning at a wedding, as much to patch an old garment with unfulled, unshrunk cloth, or to put new wine into old wine bottles. The arguments not only vindicated his disciples, but taught John's disciples that fasting has value only when it is demanded by a suitable occasion. In essence, I agree with him, he agreed with me, but since he came first, I think it's more I agree with him. That it was not this illustration of the cloth and the wineskin wasn't a, hey, you can't mix the old with the new. Rather, it was, it's not appropriate to do this. It doesn't work. Just like having fasting when the bridegroom's present, that's not the occasion. That's inappropriate. That's why my disciples don't fast. Now, I've taken up all the time, absolutely all the time, second bell's rung. Now, what I like to do is to any time I study, I want to say, now how do I apply this? Some things may be very directly to us, sometimes maybe they're not. But I think there's an element here of doing what is appropriate, that, that that's an element that maybe is an application. Um, that would be a discussion for a different time. We got half of what I plan to do today done. Next week we move on to that last section in chapter 2 and maybe I'll give you time to speak next week